Please take your Bibles with me this evening and turn to Jeremiah 37. We will be looking, Lord willing, at chapters 37 and 38 this evening, uh, somewhat ambitious and uh, yet most certainly doable. We'll be doing that again here in a few chapters as we get towards some more summary material toward the end of the book. In Jeremiah chapters 35 and 36, we were back in the days of Jehoiakim, right? The son of Josiah during his 11 year reign. Uh, this week we covered these two chapters of scripture and as we do so, we are going uh, well, back, but really forward into the days again of Zedekiah. We find ourselves in the days of Zedekiah and quite toward the beginning of his reign. In fact, might to this point be the earliest record that we have of Jeremiah's interaction with Zedekiah. Now, it was several weeks ago that we considered in Jeremiah 34 a circumstance where God told Zedekiah that Zedekiah would go to Babylon and that he would die in peace and even have, remember those fires burnt unto him, the incense that was burned unto him, because because he had found through that, that effort with the servants and, and the indentured servants being released or attempting to be released, some measure of obedience, just that little sliver of obedience uh, and thus finding in that just that little sliver of mercy because God responds to obedience. God responds with mercy. But King Zedekiah's reign, according to the record of Jeremiah, even according to the record of 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, was not a good reign. As a matter of fact, the Kings and Chronicles call him a wicked king, a king that did not write in the sight of the Lord. And, and particularly as we look into Jeremiah, what we find is, uh, though he's blatantly or, 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 or kind of uh, across the board called a, a, a king that did not write in the sight of the Lord in the Kings and Chronicles, we find him to be kind of a shaded character, a, a king who was conflicted, a king in conflict, a man who on, on one end killed the prophet of God, Uriah, Jeremiah 26. On the other end, however, would seek some measure of repentance and mercy in the final days before Babylon's overthrow. Today we are going to view that conflict in living color. We've been kind of seeing that conflict in black and white. We've seen the shades of it. We've seen a little bit here and a little bit there. We've seen a little bit of repentance. We, we, we've seen a lot of bit of evil. We're going to see real conflict in the heart of the king this evening through these two chapters. And, and in doing so, perhaps contemplate and, and give the Holy Spirit the means by which to inspect and investigate in our lives whether or not there might be a little conflict of our own. Whether or not we might be halting between two opinions as it relates to our relationship with the Lord, as it relates to our dedication to the, to the promises and the obedience that he has called us unto. So we pick up in chapter 37, verses 1 through 4, and the Bible says this, And King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, who Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land did hearken unto the words of the Lord, which he spake by the prophet Jeremiah. And Zedekiah, the king, sent Jehucal, the son of Shelemiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Maatiah, the priest to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Pray now unto the Lord our God for us. Now Jeremiah came in and went out among the people, for they had not put him into prison. So the text begins with the transition from Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, to Zedekiah as king in Judah. Uh, Coniah was also Jeconiah, uh, and he was the son of Jehoiakim. This transition took take place, and we've mentioned this any number of times now. By the end of this book, you will have the history of these final four kings down pretty comfortably. Um, and he had deposed Jeconiah because Jeconiah was the son of Jehoiakim, and, and Jeho Jehoiakim had been killed by Nebuchadnezzar, thrown out outside the city's walls and left there to rot. Not a very good ending for Jehoiakim, of course. Jeremiah said it was going to happen. 
happened according to the word of the Lord, but not a good thing. So uh, being that this was a vassal state and that there was a king, the last thing that Nebuchadnezzar would want would be to have some guy as vassal king who's angry at him and who's ready to overthrow him, right? So he deposes Jehoiah, uh, or Jeconiah, Jehoiachin, Coniah, and instead he puts in Zedekiah. A and Zedekiah quickly shows that he is uninterested in the messages of Jeremiah, as uninterested as were his predecessors. Not surprising as we've been studying this book, but throughout the various prophecies regarding Zedekiah, there has always seemed to be a part of him that even though he's not been really willing to listen to the Lord, has always wanted to seek the Lord, as if he knew the Lord was there. It's kind of like the guys I see in jail. They're constantly coming to God. They're constantly coming to, to seek the Lord. But then when I tell them what the Lord has to say to them, they're not very, in, very, much, very interested in, in obeying it, right? They, but, but they want it, right? They keep seeking to the Lord, but they're not really interested in listening and in obeying. And we've seen this time and again. We saw it in chapter 34, as we mentioned, when the king sought to bring the people in line with God, even in a very small way through repentance. Uh, we see the same here that early on in, in Zedekiah's reign, he sent two men named Jehuchal, the son of Shem, uh, Shelemiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Maatziah, asking Jeremiah to pray unto the Lord God for them. And the text notes that at this time, Jeremiah was not yet in prison. He will be in just a little while. Now, we'll get more of the context in a moment, but it is important to note that as I said, while this is likely the first chronological record of Zedekiah asking for Jeremiah's intercession, we have seen this before with Zedekiah and Jeremiah. Way back in Jeremiah 21, that was a long time ago now, but way back in Jeremiah 21, we read of a similar instance. Jeremiah 21 verses 1 and 2. The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent unto him Pasher the son of Melchiah and Zephaniah the son of Maatziah the priest saying inquire I pray thee of the Lord for us for Nebuchadnezzar that's Nebuchadnezzar just a different name for him king of Babylon maketh war against us if so be that the Lord will deal with us according to all his wondrous works that he may go up from us so way back in Jeremiah 21 Zedekiah sent two men one of the men is Pasher, the son of, uh, um, of Melchiah, and then Zephaniah, the son of Maatziah, who's the same one being sent here. Zephaniah is one of the men that's being sent here in chapter 37. And then, of course, he's being sent with a different man on these two occasions. Both times Zephaniah is sent, and do take note that this is not the Zephaniah that wrote the prophecy of Zephaniah. This is not, not that guy, right? Uh, it seems likely from the fact that Egypt is still in play here in chapter 37 that we are earlier in chapter 37 than we were in chapter 21, but there's a lot of unknowns about the timing in the book of Jeremiah. So we see in at least two direct instances, Zedekiah is sending to Jeremiah and asking him to inquire of the Lord for him. Zedekiah knows Jeremiah is the prophet of God. He may not be willing to acknowledge it, but he knows it. And even though he isn't interested in hearing what God has to say, he's interested in hearing what God has to say. There's a, there's a real conflict in Zedekiah's heart. We continue in our text, verses 5 through 10. Then Pharaoh's army was come forth out of Egypt, when, and when the Chaldeans that besieged Jerusalem heard the tidings of them, they departed from Jerusalem, then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus shall ye say to the king of Judah that sent you unto me to inquire of me. Behold, Pharaoh's army, which is come forth to help you, shall return to Egypt into their own land. And the Chaldeans shall come again and fight against the city and take it and burn it with fire. Thus saith the Lord, Deceive not yourselves, saying, The Chaldeans shall surely depart from us, for they shall not depart. For though ye had smitten the whole army of the Chaldeans that fight against you, and there remained but wounded men among them, yet should they rise up every man in his tent and burn this city with fire. So here we see a, a unique instance. What happens here is this. The king went to Jeremiah asking Jeremiah for help, but the king also went to Egypt asking Egypt for help. And Egypt responded to the king as Babylon was knocking on the door besieging the city. 
He likely offered them money and influence and such to come and to help. And Egypt did come. And when they came, the Chaldeans left. They fell back. They did not have the means, the manpower, whatever it might be. They were not prepared to face the army of Egypt. So they fell back. Egypt comes in. And in doing so, Zedekiah probably felt a pretty heavy weight of relief off of his shoulders. And as might be common among those who seek the Lord but then find relief, uh, they forget pretty quickly anything that they had intended to do as it related to any sort of devotion to the Lord. Uh, that, you know, we, people seek him in desperation, but they don't really mean <laughs> what they mean, what they say they mean when they seek to the Lord. They are only looking for a way out of their troubles. So Zedekiah is likely thinking he did a good thing. He got Egypt, Egypt came. He, as the king, saved his people by his great diplomacy of making this deal with Egypt and the Chaldeans are gone and the earthly solution worked and everything's good now. And he put Jeremiah out of his mind. He puts the Lord out of his mind. telling. Him, uh, but, but Jeremiah, the Lord did not forget Zedekiah even if Zedekiah forgot the Lord. So Jeremiah still has a message for Zedekiah here and the message is this, don't be fooled. There's coming a day when the Egyptians will go back to Egypt and the Chaldeans are coming back in. And notice the severity in many ways of these words. He says, even if, Zedekiah, you, with all of your help, with all of your pagan help, with, with, uh, with, with whatever nations come to help you, even if you could destroy the whole army with the exception of all the wounded men in Babylon, even those wounded men would rise up and would burn the city with fire. They would rise up and they would take it. God is going to give, in, in a sense, a supernatural will to the Chaldeans to take this city because it is the will of the Lord. And we're especially going to see that in the weeks to come. We are going to see that Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar Aden, who is his captain, they know that they are doing God's work. We'll talk about why it seems as though they actually regard the Lord deeper than Zedekiah regards the Lord. And we'll see that in the chapters coming up over the next two weeks. So no amount of temporal carnal solutions by the king is going to stop the judgment of God. We continue in verses 11 through 16. And it came to pass that when the army of the Chaldeans was broken up from Jerusalem for fear of Pharaoh's army, then Jeremiah went forth out of Jerusalem to go into the land of Benjamin to separate himself thence in the midst of the people. And when he was in the gate of Benjamin, the captain of the ward was there, whose name was Erijah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Hananiah, and he took Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Thou fallest away to the Chaldeans. Then said Jeremiah, It is false. I fall not away to the Chaldeans. But he hearkened not to him. So Erijah took Jeremiah and brought him, into, brought him to the princes. Wherefore the princes were wroth with Jeremiah, and smote him, and put him in the prison, in the house of Jonathan the scribe, for they had made that the prison." When Jeremiah was entered into the dungeon and into the cabins, and Jeremiah had remained there many days, and we'll pick up there in just a moment with our context. So what happens here is this. The Chaldeans leave. They leave the city because of the fear of Pharaoh's armies. The, the city had been shut up because it had been being besieged, right? It had been surrounded. It had been besieged. When a city is being sieged, they shut the, the, the gates, and no one goes in, no one goes out. They open the gates for someone to go out. Bad guys come in, right? So you don't open the gates. No one gets to leave when the, when the city's being besieged. The city is locked up tight. So the Chaldeans leave and the city is opened up. People can come, people can go. In this instance, Jeremiah decides to leave the city. In our King James Version, uh, it speaks here of him leaving the city to go into the land of Benjamin to separate himself thence in the midst of the people. Uh, there are many who, based upon the way the, the Hebrew reads, uh, believe that he was probably going to inspect a parcel of land, perhaps the piece of land that he had purchased from his cousin, um, if indeed that had happened yet. In my timeline, that hasn't happened yet, I don't believe. So I don't believe that that's it, but many commentators believe that that would be it. Another possibility, and this is what the King James translators perceived, and I think it's because they regard the timeline the same way I do, that they said, no, he couldn't be going to inspect that parcel of land, that maybe he just needed to decompress a little bit. He needed to get himself out of the city because it's been crazy for him. I mean, he's saying these things, no one's listening, Zedekiah is angry at him. All of these things are happening. Either way, he's trying to leave the city. And he gets stopped at the gate of Benjamin. 
as he's headed toward Benjamin. He gets stopped at the gate and the captain detains him and claims that he's not leaving just to leave, but he's actually leaving to defect to Babylon, that he's leaving to become one of the people who's going to flee to Babylon and say, if you'll spare my life, I will, I will serve you. Jeremiah refutes this accusation. Elijah does not believe him, so he was taken to the princes. The princes are very angry with Jeremiah. We have seen throughout their interactions that, that they don't like Jeremiah much, right? So they're angry with Jeremiah. They, they um, smite him. They, they beat him in some way, and then they throw him into uh, prison in the house of Jonathan, the scribe. Uh, it had been repurposed into a temporary holding cell in times of chaos, um, we might call it typically something like martial law, right? There tends to be a significantly high number of arrests. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of people doing things they should not do, trying to get away with things they wouldn't normally do. Law and order kind of breaks down. And in order to keep it, you tend to make a lot more arrests than you normally would. So they had repurposed the, Jonathan the scribe's house to become a prison. And they had an inner prison where they would actually lock people up and then they had the court. And so that would be the court surrounding the house. And there was probably a, a, a large wall around the house. So they could shut people in the court where the people could wander, have some freedom of movement, but still not leave. And then if you were really dangerous, they would put you, actually lock you in one of the rooms in the house so that you could, it would be like a cell. And so he is initially put into what's called here the dungeon and into the cabins, into one of the individual cells. And he is locked up there and he remains there many days. So he's there in the dungeon. We pick up in our context in verse 17, looking through verse 21. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took him out. And the king asked him secretly in his house and said, is there any word from the Lord? Seeking the Lord's word again. And Jeremiah said, there is. For, said he, thou shalt be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto the king Zedekiah, what have I offended against thee or against thy servants or against this people that ye have put me in prison? Where are now your prophets which prophesied unto you, saying, the king of Babylon shall not come against you? nor against this land. Therefore hear now, I pray thee, O my Lord the King, let my supplication, I pray thee, be accepted before thee, that thou cause me not to return to the house of Jonathan the scribe, lest I die there. And then Zedekiah the king commanded that they should commit Jer Jer Jeremiah to, into the court of the prison and that they should give him daily a piece of bread out of the baker's street until all the bread in the city were spent. Thus Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. So Jeremiah is in prison. The king calls him out of prison secretly and brings him to his own house to commune with him in secret. And he asks Jeremiah, what does the Lord have to say? Still seeming to regard Jeremiah as a prophet, as the representative of the Lord, though not very interested in what the Lord actually has to say. Zedekiah is a man in great conflict. He knows the Lord is true. He knows Jeremiah to be God's prophet, but he's struggling to be willing to obey, to believe. And he lacks the courage to associate with the Lord and with the prophet at the expense of the princes and the scribes and the priests who hate Jeremiah and who aren't interested in what he has to say. He's sitting on the fence, knowing what God wants, but struggling to believe it and obey it. Jeremiah responds with the same message. They would be delivered into the hands of Babylon. And then he asks the king, why am I imprisoned? What I said came to pass. Where are the false prophets? Where are those guys that said, no, Babylon's not going to come. They are the ones that clearly lied to you. Why aren't they the ones sitting in the prison? All Jeremiah has done is tell the truth. And he asked the king to release him uh, in fear that he would die there. Perhaps when we see the contrast between the king saying that in the court of the prison he'd have bread and Jeremiah saying, I might die there, it's quite possible that they were not getting fed in, in the, the deeper part of the prison. Food was becoming scarce. The guys that were in the deepest part of the prison are the guys that are the deepest offenders. If food goes away, they're the first ones to not have it, right? So Zedekiah responds by taking him out of that dungeon area, out of, out of those lockdown cells, and bringing him into the court, which is a much lesser level of punishment, a much lesser level of imprisonment, and where they're still feeding people, um, which is nice. Now, as we would understand it, in Jeremiah chapter 31 through 33, when Jeremiah prophesies of the new covenant, 
he did that while he was in the court of the prison. So it would be in this time after he's in the court of the prison that he writes those words. It was at that time that Baruch comes into the court of the prison to ratify that piece of land, if you recall, which is why I believe the timing would be off unless his cousin had said, hey, go take a look at this piece of land. I want to sell it to you. And he was going to take a look at it before buying it, at which point now that he's in the court of the prison, he can't go look at it. And God says, buy it anyway. Maybe is the scenario. Either way, that hadn't most likely happened yet um, when he was trying to leave the first time around. So here's Jeremiah. And he is now in the outer court of the prison and he at least has food. So that's, that's a good thing. We continue in chapter 38, verses 1 through 4. Then Shephatiah, the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, and Jukal, the son of she Shelemiah, and Pasher, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, He that remaineth in the city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, but he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live, for he shall have his life for a prey, and shall live. Thus saith the Lord, The city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore, the princes said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death. For thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in the city, and the hands of all the people in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. We find four men here, and they hear of Jeremiah being imprisoned, and they hear the words that he's preaching in prison. And he's telling the people, that if they will only submit themselves to this, to this judgment, because it is judgment, that it is in fact, and we've studied this, it is in fact submitting to the Lord by submitting to Babylon. At this point, the judgment is sure. And because the judgment is sure, the message went from repent and be delivered from Babylon to submit to, repent and submit to Babylon. At this point, Things are in motion. And now repentance would look like submission to Babylon. Repentance would not look like deliverance from Babylon. And the, 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 these four men are very angry at this. They see this as treason, right? They see this as, as weakening the morale of the military men who have to hear this. In the same way that we would consider in World War II and, and in Vietnam and in Korea, the propaganda ministry, right? Those people dropping flyers over the troops saying, saying give up and we'll show you mercy and all of those things trying to, it, it's, it's psychological warfare, right? Trying to get into the head of the enemy because if you can get into the head of the enemy and weaken their resolve, weaken their morale, then you have a significantly better chance of winning the battle. So they're saying, look, Jeremiah is weakening morale. He is getting into the heads of the men of war. He's getting into the heads of, of the people and making them question whether or not they're doing right by fighting for their nation. He's not being patriotic. He needs to die. From a carnal perspective, this is a, this is a good argument. It's a very good argument from a carnal perspective. A and so here's Zedekiah's conflict. He knows what Jeremiah is saying is true. It's been validated time and again. Jeremiah has been preaching now for decades and everything that he said has come to pass. And yet, from, a, from a, a patriotic perspective, what the people are saying is true. Jeremiah is being a problem to the morale if they keep fighting the battle. Well, well, the solution is this. Obey the word of the Lord, right? Obey the word of the Lord, submit to Babylon, done. Jeremiah is no longer lowering morale because the deed has been done and the word of the Lord is obeyed and people aren't going to die anymore. But of course, that's not what happens. So they petitioned the king to have Jeremiah put to death. And the problem is that Zedekiah knows full well, well that Jeremiah is not being treasonous in this. He is saying the truth. Verses 5 and 6. Then Zedekiah the king said, Behold, he is in your hand. For the king is not he that can do anything against you. Then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the son of Hamelech, that was in the court of the prison. And they let down Jeremiah with cords, and in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Zedekiah responds in a very strange fashion, really effectively a deeply cowardly fashion. 
He kind of plays this off nonchalantly and he says, look, he's in your power, not mine. There's nothing I can say that's going to change your mind anyway, so go do it. Almost as if he, he, he's, he doesn't really care what happens to Jeremiah. You go do it, but simultaneously not just telling them, yes, you have my permission to kill him. So he's trying to not be the one to kill Jeremiah while simultaneously not looking like he cared whether Jeremiah died, trying to play both sides, right? He's trying to please everyone. He's, he's trying to, to, to keep himself from getting himself into a bad scrape here. He doesn't want to defend Jeremiah because that would take courage and conviction, but he knows Jeremiah is right, so he's being noncommittal about his death. So the men take Jeremiah and they put him into a pit. It says that it was in the court of the prison here, and in this pit there was no water. They had to lower him down with ropes, maybe an old well of some sort, perhaps something like that, and it was just muddy in the bottom. And so they put him in there and he sunk into the mud. He probably, uh, we don't know how deep he was, but if you think about sinking into a very uh, kind of fine mud, one that would, you wouldn't stand on top, but you'd actually sink into. It was wet enough for that, but not, not wet enough that he could drink or anything of the sort. And maybe into his hips, probably somewhere, legs, hips, maybe a little higher. And he's there and you can't move. If you could imagine how claustrophobic and how uncomfortable that would be to be there for, for days on end as you're just sunk in the mire, you sleep that way. There is no food down there. There is no water down there. And effectively what they're doing is they lower him into that pit. He can't move and he's going to be there until he he dies of, of, of dehydration. And that's what's going to happen to Jeremiah. They're not going to feed him. He's in the pit. He, that's it. He's done with. And this would be the lowest point in Jeremiah's ministry. It might account, in fact, for some of the cries that we read about early in the book. Remember how early in the book there was a lot of Jeremiah crying out to the Lord for vengeance and for justice? And we talked about that, and it seemed almost a little out of place at the time because we'd not seen a whole lot of a whole lot of things happening to him yet, other than them not listening. And certainly there was a frustration over the people not listening, but there, those, some of that might have been written at this time, not, not while he's in the pit, obviously, but in relation to this experience, when he is sunk in the mire in this pit, he can't move, and he's just, he's just gonna die. But he doesn't die. Verses seven through 13. Now when Abedmelech, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin, Abedmelech went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, for he, and he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded, this is interesting, then the king commanded Abedmelech, the Ethiopian, saying, take from hence 30 men with thee and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he die. So Abedmelech took the men with him and went into the house of the king under the treasury and took thence old cast clouts and old rotten rags and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. And Abedmelech the Ethiopian said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast clouts and rotten rags under thine armholes under the cords. And Jeremiah did so. So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him up out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. So Jeremiah is down in this pit. He's going to die. We don't know how long he was down there. But then there's this Ethiopian eunuch named Abedmelech. Abedmelech simply means servant of the king. So we don't know if it was that. He may not even have had a name. He may have just been, uh, hey, servant of the king, right? That was the name they gave him. Anyway, he's a slave. He is a eunuch. He is in the court of the king. And he hears about Jeremiah. And he goes and he speaks to the king in the gate of Benjamin. I don't know all of the ins and outs of the custom, but that must have been very bold for a servant to leave the house. I mean, this guy is not even, he's not even Jewish. He's an Ethiopian guy probably sold into slavery, brought into the king's court. He, gets, he goes out of the house. He goes to the gate of Benjamin where the king is. He confronts the king and he says, what's happening to Jeremiah is wrong. He is going to die. And of course, the king says the same thing. He said to the other guys, right? I don't care, whatever. It's in their hands. No, that's not what the king says. The king says, go get 30 men and pull them out of the pit. Can you sense the conflict in this guy? 
I mean, he's the one that gave them permission to do whatever you want with him. And now go get that guy out of the pit. There's a real conflict happening in the heart of Zedekiah. So Abednelech gets 30 men, they go and they tie cords and they get, they, get, they get these ropes and they lower it down and Jeremiah gets his arms underneath these things. We don't know how weak he was. We don't know how long he'd been down there. And they pull him out of this pit before he dies. And they leave him in the court of the prison where at least there's food. Verses 14 through 16. Then Zedekiah, the king, sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing, hide nothing from me. Then Jeremiah said unto, king, unto Zedekiah, If I declare it unto thee, wilt thou not surely put me to death? And if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? So Zedekiah the king swears secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death. Neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Zedekiah secretly calls for Jeremiah again. Once again, no one's supposed to know about this. This time they don't meet at his house. They meet in the temple complex. Zedekiah says, what does the Lord have to say to me? And he specifically asks Jeremiah to not hold anything back. Tell me everything the Lord has to say. Jeremiah is very frustrated and somewhat confused by this. You can tell by the way he speaks here. He says, you want me to tell you what the Lord says so that you can get angry at me and kill me? Or you want me to tell you what the Lord says even though I'm going to say it and you're not going to listen? You know that frustration, right? A person very, who's very indecisive, who says one thing and then changed their mind. I, I had this roommate in college and he had a bad group of friends and he kept coming to me with all his problems. And he'd say, you know, such and such said this and did this and this and that. And I would sit and I would listen to him very patiently and then I'd look at him and I'd say to him, you need to, you need to get new friends. You want to solve your problem, you need to get new friends. And it got to the point where he'd come in and say, Jamin, I've got a problem. And I'd look at him and I'd say, I don't need to hear it. You need to get new friends. He could give himself my counsel. He could just sit in front of the mirror, say his problem, say, you need to get new friends and move on with his day. He didn't need to waste my time telling me what was wrong because he was going to get the same advice. You need to get new friends, right? And, and, and for me to sit there and say, okay, I'm going to listen to you and then I'm going to give you advice, but are you, are you going to, are you going to, are you going to listen to me, right? Are you going to take it? Does, is anything I'm going to say, is it worth me even saying? Are, are you going to listen? That's kind of the idea here. Jeremiah says, look, you keep coming to me. And you keep asking what the Lord has to say. And I keep telling you what the Lord has to say. And then I keep getting thrown into prison and you don't even obey what the Lord has to say. Can we just stop the game? Is this worth it? Right? That's kind of the frustration. That's the idea happening here in Jeremiah. So Zedekiah seeks to ease Jeremiah a little bit and he swears to Jeremiah secretly that he will not put him to death nor will he allow the men that are seeking his life to put him to death. So Jeremiah has some measure of comfort there. Of course, God has also promised Jeremiah safety. Um, so uh, we don't exactly know where Jeremiah's mind is as far as the relation to God's promises there. But, um, but those, those promises are now in place. We continue then in verses 17 through 19. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live in thine house. But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall the city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand and they mock me. So Jeremiah tells him plainly, look, you've got choice. Now, remember, we've already seen other promises. God has promised that Zedekiah will, will go to Babylon in peace, and that he will, he will die in peace, right? So Zedekiah knows that because God has already promised that to him. But the manner of his departure is still up in the air, very much up in the air. Is he going to leave 
having his whole family intact, having his dignity intact, having the city not be burned with fire? Or is he going to continue to rebel and the city is going to be burned and it will not be well with his family and it will not be well with him, though he will still go to Babylon and die in peace. So the manner of his departure is still very, very much up in the air. And Jeremiah says simply, look, if you just obey the Lord, submit to Babylon, go out to the princes, give up the city, you'll be taken to Babylon, the city will not be burned with fire, more people will live, things will be much better. If you don't do that, the city's going to be burned, your family's going to have troubles, you're going to have troubles, things are not going to be well, a lot more people are going to die. It's as simple as that. It's a no-brainer, really. Except it isn't. Zedekiah says, I'm afraid. Now, this fear is likely a, a cop-out. He says, I'm afraid of the Jews that have defected to the Chaldeans. I'm afraid that they're going to mock me. I'm afraid that they are going to, that they are going to uh, uh, as, as might happen in various situations, uh, when the king comes out and he gives himself up in battle. I mean, if you read in the Old Testament about what would happen when a nation gets the enemy's king, right? It was ugly. They would, they would, they would parade him. They would mock him. They would put out his eyes. They would, they would cut off his thumbs. They would do all sorts of things to cripple him. And then they would basically kind of make him like a rag doll, a puppet of, of their victory. It was not a good thing to be a king and to get caught in battle. This is why Saul asked his armor bearer to kill him, lest he get put into the, lest he get captured by the Philistines. King did not want to be captured. That was the last thing that any king wanted, right? So Zedekiah is afraid of these things. Jeremiah thus responds to him. Again, he's speaking in the word of the Lord, 20 to 23. But Jeremiah said, they shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee. Can you hear the, the eagerness and the desire in, Je in Jeremiah's voice here? Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee. So it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord has showed me. And behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes. And those women shall say, Thy friends have set thee on and have prevailed against thee. Thy feet are sunk in the mire and they are turned away back. So they shall bring out all thy wives and thy children to the Chaldeans and thou shalt not escape out of their hand, but shall be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon and thou shalt cause this city to be burned with fire. So Jeremiah says, you know what? It's the exact opposite. What you're thinking, Zedekiah, is the exact opposite of what is actually going to happen. If you do go out to them, you will not be mocked. It will be well with you. You will not be paraded. But if you don't, if they have to get you the hard way, then there's going to be problems. If you refuse, then you will be mocked. The very women of his court will mock his failures. Jeremiah says, it's one thing to have military men mocking you. It's another thing to have the women in your own court mocking you, right? The very fears of his heart that he will fail will come to pass if he doesn't commit to the Lord, if he doesn't obey. And on top of that, Jeremiah says, the city will burn. No one will escape. So by Jeremiah's word, there's absolutely no reason not to obey the word of the Lord, which he knows to be true. Of course, we could always say that. But Zedekiah is seeing it here, but he's in great conflict. We finish up the chapter, verses 24 through 28. Then said Zedekiah unto Jeremiah, Let no man know of these words, and thou shalt not die. But if the princes hear that I have talked with thee, and they come to thee and say to thee, Declare unto us now what thou hast said unto the king. Hide it not from us, and we will not put thee to death. Also what the king said unto thee. Then thou shalt say unto them, I presented my supplication before the king, that he would not cause me to return to Jonathan's house to die there. Then came all the princes to Jeremiah and asked him, and he told them according to all these words that the king had commanded. So they left off speaking with him, for the matter was not perceived. So Jeremiah abode in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken. And he was there when Jerusalem was taken. How do we know that Zedekiah wasn't going to obey the prophets? Because he doesn't determine to stand up here. He doesn't determine to deliver Jeremiah out of the court of the prison. He doesn't determine anything of the sort. All he says is, don't tell anyone that we spoke and don't tell them what we spoke about. And then he says, if somebody does find out that we spoke and they come up and they threaten you and ask you what we spoke about, 
Tell them that you were begging not to go back into the court of the prison and don't tell them anything else, which was true. Jeremiah did ask not to go back into the court of the prison. And so the princes at some point did hear about this. They asked Jeremiah about it and he tells them what he was told to tell them. They did not find out that Jeremiah had also given him these other prophecies. And he remained in prison until the point where Babylon takes over because Zedekiah did not listen. He did not listen. Now we apply, and, and as we do so, we're going to focus here on Zedekiah. Throughout these two chapters, as we've said, we find a man in tremendous conflict. He knows what is right. At times he seems to want what is right, but he lacks the will to do what is right. And there's any number of reasons that it would appear. If we were to walk through, and we'll do this a little bit in our applica application time, it seems as though he lacks the will, uh, he lacks the courage to stand against the people. It seems as though he also lacks the courage to trust that if he goes out and gives himself to Babylon that he won't be mocked and he won't be abused. And so he fears for himself, his reputation, uh, he fears for his life, he fears for his treatment. All of these unknowns and all of the assurances of the prophet were not enough to allay his fears. And this is not an uncommon state for a human, is it? It's not uncommon even in our midst, even as believers. There's a real difference between knowledge and faith, isn't there? The difference between believing something with the mind and believing it with the heart. Between knowing something and, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, abiding in it. And what this often comes down to is a choice. A decision whether or not God's word is actually true. Whether or not we actually believe it's true. Whether or not God's word is worth trusting, even if it conflicts with what we might see with our eyes or our uh, natural human expectations or experiences. Can I trust that if I do it God's way, even if it doesn't seem to make sense to me, even if it's not the way the world around you is doing it, even if it's not what is most comfortable, can I trust that if I do it God's way, it will be best for me? This is not something that just Zedekiah struggles with, is it? I'm guilty. It's not easy to see the entire world going in one direction and to say, you know what, they're going there and it's kind of working for them, but God has this other way. And this way is the way that, that God wants it done. And he says that if I go this way, there's a blessing, but if I go this way, there's, there's security. But, but, but there's blessing here. Yeah, but there's security here. Maybe it wouldn't be as hard if we were in a third world country and there's no security over here. Right? The way the world is doing it is just garbage anyway. And so I, I really, there's not a lot of choice. But, but when, there, when there's security here, when there's opportunity here and God says do, it, do things this way, that's not an easy, when, when, when there's, there's, there's temporal success, material success here and God says do it this way and I'll take care of you. And it'll be okay, but you have to trust me. That's a hard thing. Zedekiah is not the only one that goes through that. James warns about this condition in two distinct ways in James chapter 1. First, he warns about this condition, which we would really see Zedekiah in very strongly this evening, called double-mindedness. It's a condition of halting between two opinions, of knowing which way to go, but not knowing which way you want to go. James encourages in verses 5 through 8 of chapter 1, he says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord, a double-minded man, is unstable in all his ways. Wisdom comes from God. The capacity to know the right decision is sourced in God's word. We often say that God is not in the business of hiding himself from us. At least I often say that. Well, he's not in the business of withholding from us the capacity to live this life with wisdom either. If a man lacks wisdom, God says, let him ask for it, but let him do so in faith. What does that mean? Does that mean I believe that God is going to give me wisdom when I ask? 
That's not actually fundamentally the idea here. The idea of asking in faith is not just the idea that I'm going to ask for wisdom and I believe God's going to give it to me. What it means is that I ask God for wisdom to know and then I combine that request with the faith to obey. In other words, when I ask for wisdom, what I might find is something that the Proverbs tell me, right? The book of wisdom. So I say, God, give me wisdom in this circumstance. And God says, be angry and sin not. Oh, that's not Proverbs, but the idea. God, I say, Lord, give me wisdom, and the Lord says, despise not the chastening of the Lord. I say, Lord, give me wisdom, and God says, answer not a fool according to his folly. And I, I, I gain that wisdom, and I say, wow, I don't like that answer. Uh-uh, not me. That's not for me. Lord, give me wisdom, and God says, obey your parents. Lord, give me wisdom, and God says, don't get into debt. Lord, give me wisdom, and God says, avoid that kind of a woman, avoid that kind of a man. Make no friends with an angry man. And I say, but that's not the answer I wanted. Well, here's the thing. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him but let him ask in faith. What have we been learning about on Tuesday nights about faith? Faith presupposes works. Faith is when I take what I know God has to say and I do something about it. It's believing what God has said is true. Ask in faith. In other words, say this, God, I want your way and I'm ready to obey. That's asking in faith. You don't ask in faith? At what point is God going to say the same thing Jeremiah said? Why should I tell you when you're not even going to listen to me? Why should I give you wisdom when you're just going to walk the other direction anyway? The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You want to know what asking in faith is. Asking his faith is coming to God and saying, God, I need your help. And when you tell me what that is, I'm going to do it. And just saying, ah, I, I don't know that I like what God just said, but I know he said it. I'm going to do it. That is asking in faith. And let not the man who won't ask in faith think that he'll receive anything of the Lord. It's not enough just to know. Solomon was a, a wise man. We read about him in Ecclesiastes, right? Solomon had all of that wisdom that the Lord had given to him, and he said, I want to prove that wisdom. And so he goes out and he tries everything, right? He tries women and he tries building projects and he tries everything. And he reaps the negative rewards of that. He had all of that wisdom, but he didn't appropriate it in faith. And he did not thus receive the benefit of it in his life because he didn't follow it. The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The man whose heart is hardened to God, to God's wisdom, should not expect to receive the blessings of wisdom. Jeremiah asked that in, in chapter 38. Why should I give you God's word if you're just going to ignore it? Why should God give us wisdom if we're just going to ignore it? If we are double-minded, if we're halting between two opinions, seeking to know what God says but not willing to obey what God says, don't expect to receive anything but instability in all your ways ups and downs, the roller coaster ride of emotions and of circumstances, because one minute you're on board and the next minute you're not. One minute you're ready to follow, the next minute you're not. So you're starting and you're stopping and it's like when a person's learning to drive and they're on the brakes and you're doing this, right? Because there is just, there, there's, there's a stop and there's a go and there's a halting and there's no confidence and there's no willingness to just commit and all of this is there. That, if that's your Christian life, then you're not receiving from the Lord that which is best. You're halting between two opinions. You're double-minded. This warning gives way to a second warning in James chapter 1, a little bit farther down. Verses 21 through 25. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, in a mirror. 
For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, that man shall be blessed in his deed. Does this, do these verses make a lot more sense now that you know what those other verses said? It's the same topic. It's the doer and the hearer. It's, it's the, the one who wants the wisdom but needs the faith to take what he hears and does it. These are the same thing. It's just a different way of describing it. You pray for wisdom, be ready to obey it. You become a hearer of the word, be ready to be a doer as well. We've talked about this any number of times. This passage of scripture, the man who knows the will of God as reflected in the word of God, he knows what needs to be done. And the question is, is he going to do it? And James says that the man who hears the word but doesn't do it is living self-deception. He hears the word of God. He says, amen. He nods his head. He knows what he's doing. He knows that it's true. And then he walks away and he leaves unchanged. Back into disobedience. And he feels like because he agrees with what God says, it's enough. And he never bothered to actually obey it. It's enough to just agree. As long as I agree, right? Well, no, it's not enough to just agree. It doesn't matter until you do it. It doesn't matter until you appropriate it. It doesn't matter until it's yours. That's when things happen. That's when things change. That's when there's power. That's when there is blessing. There is none of that if you just hear it until you do it, until you believe it. The man who is blessed in his deed is not the hearer of God's word. It is the doer of God's word. The man who walks away from the law of liberty and rests by faith in its expectations and promises, not being a forgetful hearer, but being a doer of the work. That's the blessed man. That's the blessed woman. Young people, if I can particularly appeal to you, most of you know that my youth is a description of this very thing. I was kind of a halter between two opinions. I've given that testimony on any number of occasions. Knowing stuff, even wanting stuff. I'm kind of like, I was like a little Zedekiah. I knew God's word pretty well. I wanted what God had to say, but I wasn't willing to actually get around to doing it. I stopped just short of really being ready to commit to actually yield myself, put myself on the altar to the Lord. There was no blessing there. There's kind of the, the backwash of blessing. It's like the, the fringes of blessing, like you're, 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 you're kind of swimming in the same pool as blessing and you can kind of feel some of the ripples of blessing when you're there because you're getting the word of God and, and, and you're, you know, you're kind of living it and whatnot. And so there's, there's like this, this kind of, feel a little bit of blessing, but you're not, you don't even know what you're missing when you're not actually there. But when I had the character to finally believe that what God said was true and to be willing to obey it, that, that is when life changed for me. That is when everything changed. That is when I went from sitting on the sidelines to getting onto the field. And that is when things really started happening. Things that when, when, when God said in Jeremiah, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath come into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. The people who have never stepped into that place of obedience, you can't even understand, understand fathom what you're missing by not being there if you've never been there before. So let's ask some questions based upon this concept as we close. Number one, has a love for the world caused you to halt between two opinions? Are you one of those you want to do what's right, but you just love the pleasures of sin? You want to do what's right, but you have fooled yourself into thinking that the call to obey the word of God is a call to lose something rather than a call to gain something. See, that's a lie of the devil. This is a great deceit of sin. Sin makes you think that God is holding you back from something, withholding something that is worthy and fulfilling and needful. Now, are you missing out on something by not heading into the world and indulging the pleasures of sin for a season? In a manner of speaking, yes. In a manner of speaking, from one perspective, yes. Is this something that is enjoyable to the flesh? Yes. But that isn't the whole story. 
right? That's like the salesman who comes to you and gives you all the great benefits of his product without telling you any of the, the side effects, without telling you any of the problems. These are all the great things that's going to happen, but just don't ask the questions about what, what, what problems it's going to cause in the meantime. Two thoughts here then. First, if we concede the point that the denial of, uh, of, of sin, that not sinning, brings about a loss. It is a loss that is at any and every point worthy of sacrifice. We could go to so many passages to consider this point. Jesus is teaching in Matthew 6, Philippians chapter 3, Paul's declarations. But consider with me very briefly 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. This is under that premise that says that you actually do lose something when you step out of the world and, and you deny your flesh. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. It was Jim Elliot who wrote those now famous words, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. The world will pass away, even, even if we uh, go ahead and follow that premise, which is misleading, but that premise that says that if you don't go into this world of sin, you're missing out on something. Even if we follow that premise, everything that you're missing out on is going to burn up with this world. It's temporal. It passes away. It's fleeting. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. This is the difference between me going to the hardware store and buying one of those tools for dirt cheap that you use once or twice and then it breaks and then you throw it away and me buying the solid tool with the lifetime warranty that I'll use and I'll give to Benjamin and he'll use and he'll give to his son and he'll use. One of them is excessively temporal. The other one will last forever. Right? Illustri illustratively speaking. Sin is temporary. The pleasure of sin is temporary. Those moments of sin, those few moments, that day, that hour, that moment, that week, whatever it is of sin, and then it's gone and there's nothing to it, and it's left you worse than it found you. It's empty. It does not, it cannot endure, it does not, and it cannot bring satisfaction, true satisfaction. But the man that does the will of God, that is forever. It's not just that it brings you to a place of satisfaction in this life, it follows you into eternity. We tried to wrap our minds a little bit around eternity in Sunday school this morning. Of course, it's impossible. It's a long time. So even if we concede the pleasure of sin, it's still nothing more than vanity and vexation of spirit, as Solomon would call it. But here's the thing. Righteousness is not just eternal. It is also abundantly joyful. Now, the righteous aren't always happy, right? Suffering in this life is very real. The suffering for righteousness sake is very real. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the joy, the peace, the contentment found in obedience is unlike anything that the world has to offer. Whatever it is that those commercials uh, for the pleasures of sin, whatever it is that those billboards about the pleasure of sin, whatever it is that those people who testify to the pleasures of sin for a season, whatever it is that they say they find in temporary joy and fulfillment from those things, they only think that it gives them any sort of happiness because they've never actually tasted true joy. They've never actually known what it is to live in satisfaction and contentment. They've never known what it is to walk in the way of the Lord. It's well beyond this world's capacity to understand. And if it's beyond their capacity to understand, then you can know full well it is beyond their capacity to reproduce. You want true joy. You want contentment. You want those things. They are only found in Christ, in His way. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 
Simply put, the child of God can be no happier than when he's in full fellowship with his heavenly father. And he's feasting at the table of his father's goodness and blessing. Number two, has the fear of man caused you to halt between two opinions? So first, has the love for the world caused you to halt between two opinions? Second, has the fear of man caused you to halt between two opinions. Zedekiah was afraid. He was afraid that he was going to be mocked. He was afraid that he was going to get hurt. He was afraid of his princes. He was afraid of the scribes. He was afraid of the priests. He was afraid of the Babylonians. He was afraid of the defectors who had defected to the Babylonians. He was afraid of everybody, except God. Right? There was no fear of God. So that as the scroll of Jeremiah was being read, they were happy. I guess that was not him. That was his predecessor. So can't really talk about the, the scroll being torn up, I guess, and thrown in the fire. But the idea, there was no fear of God before his eyes. He feared everyone else but God. You can discern the conflict within the king in these chapters. We've talked about that at length. He's a double-minded man, driven by the fear of man. And the question is, is that you? Are you afraid that that unbeliever will laugh at you, will think that you're strange, will not like you, will get angry at you if you stand up for what's right, will get angry at you if you ask him if he goes to church, will be angry with you if you encourage him to do what's right? Are you afraid of that other believer who's not quite on the same page you are? Are you afraid that they're going to get angry at you or that they're going to think that you're judging them, or they're going to call you a name, or they're going to call you, you know, they're going to say you're a Pharisee, or, or whatever it might be, you're, you're holier than thou. Are you afraid of man? Do you fear man more than you fear God? Are you more willing to set aside what God has asked of you for the sake of man's perception than you are to set aside man's perception to do what God has asked of you? The fear of man is a powerful thing. Are you halting between two opinions because of the fear of man? Are you afraid to share the gospel? Are you afraid to stand for what is right? Are you afraid to do these things because you might be disliked or, 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 or marginalized? Now, not every battle is one to fight. But if you choose not to fight a battle spiritually, let it not be because you're afraid of people. How is it that we can fear our neighbor more than we can fear God? How is it that we can fear our friends, that we can fear our government more than the creator of all flesh? Third point. First, has a love for the world caused you to halt between two opinions? Second, has the fear of man caused you to halt between two opinions? Third, has personal pride caused you to, fall, to halt between two opinions? You know what is right, but to admit it would be to admit that you are wrong. Maybe you have a parent who's told you what's right for years and you've ignored it. And as you get older, you now realize that what they said was true. But you don't want to repent because that would mean admitting that your parents were right. And you don't want to do that. And so you're just going to keep doing what's wrong even though you now know it's wrong because you'd rather do what's wrong than admit that they were right. You been there? My wife talks about her trials of being a youngest child. And one of the trials of being the youngest in her family, she says, is that uh, she would have one of her sisters, who were older, of course, come up and tell her something. And she knew that it was right. But at the moment that her sister told her to do it, she didn't want to do it anymore because her sister had told her to do it. That's a pride issue, right? You halt between two opinions because you don't want to give someone the satisfaction of making of thinking that you did what they told you or of that they were right. You sat in church for years pretending to be a believer and now you know that you're a false convert and an unbeliever but to admit it, to accept Christ and then to follow the Lord and believer's baptism would be to admit that you were a false convert. And you don't want the church knowing that you've been a false convert. Better to just remain in your state of unbelief than humble yourself and let the church know you are a false convert. It's just pride. You've been in secret sin and you want it gone. You don't like your sin, but you're struggling with your sin. But you need help. You don't want to tell your parents, though. 
because you don't want your parents to think that you, who they think is some great kid, might not be as great as you think they think you are. And you think that they'll think less of you if they knew that you were a sinner like everyone else. And so you just sit in your sin and you don't get the help you need and you play the hypocrite. And you play the hypocrite simply because you don't have the humility to, to admit to others that you have a problem and that you need help with that problem. To talk to your parents, to talk to your pastor. That's pride. Is your pride causing you to halt between two opinions? Is it your pride that's stopping you from getting things figured out and from becoming a doer of the work? Has personal pride caused you to halt between two opinions? Fourth and final point. Has the fear of the unknown caused you to halt between two opinions? You desperately want to do what's right. You know God is calling you to that thing. You know God wants you to make that decision. You know God wants you to take that step. But you don't know what's around that corner. You don't know what turning that corner is actually going to look like. God's saying step, and you don't know what's going to happen when you take it. All he's told you is step. He hasn't told you what you're stepping into, but he's told you to step. God is asking you to make the decision, but you have no control and you don't know what will happen. You have God's promises. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You have God's promises. This man shall be blessed in his deed. But that's all. And so you freeze and you halt and you stagnate because you're afraid of the unknown. But what is darkness to us is light to God. Where God leads, God always provides, if we'll only trust him. So are you halting between two opinions? Do you know what you need to do, but your fear of the unknown is keeping you from doing it? Four points. Has a love for the world caused you to halt between two opinions? Has the fear of man caused you to halt between two opinions? Has personal pride caused you to halt between two opinions? Has the fear of the unknown caused you to halt between two opinions? How are you doing this evening? Zedekiah was a king in conflict because he fell short of faith. He knew what was right, but he allowed any number of fears, of concerns, of sins to stand between what he knew to be right and what he was willing to do, or what he needed to do. He lacked the courage and the conviction to do what he knew was right. He lacked the courage and conviction to rest upon the promises of God. He feared man. He feared the unknown. He contended with his own pride. He had too much of a love for this world, so he halted into inaction, drifting toward truth and obedience, only to draw back at the last, and as we'll see over the coming weeks, suffered dramatic consequences because of it. There is no blessing in halting between two opinions. There's no blessing in coming and sitting in these seats and listening to the word of God and walking away more knowledgeable if you don't obey. How are you doing this evening? Has God pinpointed some area of your life that needs some work? Are you willing to trust, to step out, to obey the word of the Lord and to do what is necessary by faith? Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.